Hi everyone, welcome to Richmond Community College's YouTube channel. Today we're going to be looking at some of our students' projects on connecting a math problem with a specific person and bridging that gap there. Now they can choose any person they want. It could be a family member, a friend, a neighbor, a relative. It could even be a historical figure and finding a math problem that connects to them. And hopefully not too surprising at the end of the day, math should be connected to everyone, including you. So go ahead and let's take a look at what they found. Okay, so tell me one thing. Have you always been interested in math and science? Yeah, math and science were always my strong suits um, in school. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, what, uh, what interested you in pharmacy? Was it math and science or was it just a peak of interest out of nowhere? Well, um, I did other things that had to do with science before I actually found my way into pharmacy. Uh, but I like the way that pharmacy combined biology and chemistry and math and all of it together. Got you. So what is, um, what is a type of math that you would use in a pharmaceutical setting? Well, if you're in like a lab setting or a compounding pharmacy, you might use a lot more math. But being in community pharmacy, I still use math. Um, one example would be... Um, like if you have a um, a doctor wants a child to have, uh, say, like 250 milligrams of something, but you only have 400 per five, uh, then you can take what you have, the 400 per five, and find out how many mLs they'd have to take to get their 250 milligram dose. So what you're going to do is you're going to cross multiply here the five times the 250 and give you 1,250, and then you'll divide it by your 400, and you'll come up with 3.125 mLs. So therefore, you can use what you have on hand to be able to get the concentration or the dosage that the doctor wants for the child or the patient. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Hello, I'm Lawrence Garner. I'm here with Gary Holman, and he's going to show us how he incorporates math in his job as a transformer technician. All right, as, as a transformer technician, one of the, one of the t tests we do is a transformer turns ratio. And in, in order to uh, ensure that your factory tests are calculated and outright with your nameplate values, you're going to take uh, 50 MVA, which this is going to be your MVA. You're going to take 50 MVA and divide that by 138 KV times the square root of 3. It's going to give you your 209.18 amps. You divide that by the square root of 3, you're going to get 120.72 amps. All right, then that's your first configuration, which is a delta. Your second configuration on this transformer is a Y. So you're going to take your 50 MVA, you're going to divide that by 115 kV, you multiply that by the square root of 3, which is going to give you only one current for the Y side. So, now that you've got your current for the Y side, and you got two currents for your delta side, you always use your phase, and this is uh, only one current, so you, it's your line and phase for your Y. So then you take your 251.02 amps, you're going to divide that, as you see what I did right here, you're going to divide that by your 100. 20.72 amps which is your phase for your delta and that's going to equal out to a 2.07 to 1 turns ratio in your transformer and another way you could do it is you could just do 138 kV you're going to divide that by 115 kV and you're going to multiply that by the square root of 3 and this is going to give you 2.07 to 1 as well on your turn on your TTR which is a very important test when you're first starting to test your transformers all right that conducts our interview I want to thank you for your time Gary Holman oh yeah no problem my name is Alexis Hoffman and this is the introduction part of my math and people project 
Um, in this project, we're asked to explain or pick a specific person and explain how math relates to them and their lives. In the next clip, you will see my good friend Joe explain how math is related to his job and how he uses it on a daily basis and an example that he may come across one day. Now, keep in mind that jobs are really not the only place that you see math. You can see math all the time, including driving while calculating how much gas you need or the price of food whenever you eat or while shopping even. And there's so many more times you can come across math problems that you don't even think about. But without further ado, here's my good friend Joe explaining how math is related to him. Hey, I'm Joseph Miles. This is for Alexis Hoffman's How Math Affects Our Everyday Life. And she's interviewing me, Joe Miles. And I work at Dairy Queen and I'm a cashier and so I work with money all the time. I add and subtract different numbers and decimals all the time. Has taxes on top of that and discounts everywhere and stuff like that. But in this example, P will be the price, S will be sales tax, L will be a large blizzard, M will be a medium blizzard, <clears throat> and T will be the toppings on top of it. And in this example, someone will be ordering one large blizzard, two medium blizzards, and two extra toppings on top of each blizzard. So it'll be six in total of all toppings. And the price, and then with this example, it'll be P equals S in, in, outside of parentheses, 4.49 plus two parentheses, 389, which is the price for the medium, and then plus six in parentheses, 0.59, which is the price of the H topping. And if you put that all together, the price, the total for all those blizzards without sales tax will be 1581. And then after sales tax is added in, which is 0 0.0675, and if you put that together with the one, multiply that by one, then multiply that by the 15.81, your total will be 1688. And then if that person were to give $20 to me, the change will be 312. Thank you. All right, I am sitting here with Paul Haber, retired U.S. Army First Sergeant and former U.S. Army Sniper. Now, Mr. Haber, I am going over the mathematics and lawns at distance shooting, and I couldn't think of a better person to ask than you. So we're going Meaning to... Meaning you don't know a better person that you can actually, that would spend five minutes with you and explain it and do this, right? That's fair. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so we're going to go over the um, how to calculate range and wind speed in today's equations because there's way too much math involved that I've painfully found out when it comes to shooting. So we're going to go over range first. So how do you usually calculate range whenever you're trying to take an account for a long distance shot? All right. The thing about range, and people got to understand beforehand, a bullet doesn't travel like a laser in a straight line. Right. It goes in a A parabolic arc. arc. Right. Now, because of that, you have to you have to know the distance because of how far the bullet drops with gravity, how far it raises. Because the bullet actually goes up, like the the round we're shooting today, um, the six point five Grendel. At a hundred yards, it actually will hit one inch. Well, depending, I mean, what bullet you're using, because they change, but about an inch higher than the barrel. Okay, so. You have to know the range you're shooting at to adjust for where the bullet's actually striking, as opposed to, you know, to, to figure out gravity. So what we do, like in my scope, it has mils, markings of, that are a mil, which is a mil radian, which is a measurement in a circle. And I would lie if I told you exactly how many mils I should remember, but it's a small portion of angle, maybe 12 mils to a degree or something like that. Okay, you with me so far? All right, so when I look down my target, down, down my, my scope, I'll see a target, and I have to know or approximate the height of a target. For instance, the target we're shooting at today is what we call an E-type, and I know that it's 36 inches tall from the bottom of the target to the top of the head, okay? Right, but the actual target itself we're going to be shooting and be showing later in the video is a 6-inch can. Well, we're going to shoot at the 36 first, 
then maybe we'll shoot at the six inch can. Yeah. Got <laughs> Just in case I miss. Uh, but anyway, so what we do is we take that height in yards. So for a 36 inch target, for instance, it'd be one yard. That's why I love a 36 inch target, it makes the math easy, okay? So 36 inches or one yard times a thousand divided by the observed mills, which means how many mills from the top of the target through my scope, how many mill dots I count down. Right, and we've uh, already counted down. Since we already mills. went out to the range and did it, right? It was a 36 inch target, so one times a thousand. Which is, that's a tough one. One times a thousand, yeah, that, that's some heavy duty math right there. Divided by, and it was five mils tall, if you remember me saying that. Roger. Right? So, that's easy. It's a thousand divided by five, 200 yards to the target, right? Luckily, easy math. Really, once you know what the formula is. So. Now, if I was doing that six inch target, the beer can. Okay. We do the math again. Now that's only six inches tall, so it's one sixth, right? Right. Of a yard. So it'd be one sixth times a thousand divided by five. So six goes into a thousand. Oh man, my brain's hurting. One six six. 66 divided by 5, which is still going to come out to be 200 yards. Okay? Okay. You with me? All right. All right, so we got the range down. Uh, now, I know a lot, in lo a lot of long distance shooting, you have to calculate wind. Right. Now, luckily, wind wasn't really a factor for us, but let's say, for example, wind was a factor. What would you do in the case of a 10 mile per hour wind? Okay. Well, that depends, Matt, all right? It depends on where the wind's coming from, because <laughs> that will change. What we call a full value wind means it's coming straight left to right. So a 10 mile an hour wind, and that's what we're going to do the math on, okay. is a full value 10 mile an hour wind. Now, if it's a half value, that means it's coming from like the front corners or the back corners. And then you'd only use half of that because it's only half affecting on the side. You understand how it works? Roger. All right, but we're going to do, say, a 10 mile an hour wind. We know the range is 200 yards. Well, the formula is the range in hundreds of yards, okay, times your wind speed in miles per hour, divided okay. by a constant, which is 15. So the range two, because 200 yards, right, times, we said, we said 10 mile an hour full value, so 10, divided by 15. So that's 20 divided by 15, and I'm going to use my flipping calculator because that's more math than I'm going to do right at the moment. Um, calculator. 20 divided by 15. So that would be 1.3333 repeated, right? So that would make it one and a third mils of adjustment, okay? One and a third mil adjustment. Now, my scope is a one quarter minute of angle. That's one quarter mil, okay? So to go one mil, I'd have to adjust four times. So one and a third, I would move that adjustment five or six. That's kind of a, you see what I mean? So then I just adjust my click, which would put my point of aim one and three one hundredths of a minute of angle to the left. Ish. Ish, right. Because that whole... <clears throat> okay. All right, well, I think that's enough math for, uh, for the day. I say we hit the range and see if we can make something blow up. Sounds good.
So today we're going to learn about the Pythagorean theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So whenever you have a right triangle, um, we have one right here, and the sides are 9, 16, and 25. But on the inside we have 3, 4, and 5. So we're going to take 3, 4, and 5, and we're going to, this is going to be side A, and this is going to be side B, and side C is your longest side. So the philosopher that found this was Pythagoras. And you're going to take a squared, which is 3 squared, plus b squared, which is 4 squared, and that's going to equal c squared, which is 5 squared. So that's going to put you at 9 plus 16 equals 25. So that's just the basic Pythagorean theorem. But once you want to find the hypotenuse, you're going to have c equals the square root of a squared plus b squared. So that would mean if you were looking for c, the longest side, you would have to take a squared, which is 3, b squared, and then you would have to square root it. So that's what you would have to do. And also, you have um, a and B are your two short sides. C is your longest side. And the hypotenuse, it provides us with the relationship between the sides in a right triangle. So, Pythagoras is the person I chose. And he's connected to math through the Pythagorean theorem. And he's also connected um, in math through even and odd numbers and he assisted in the help of irrational numbers. But he can find angles for, for everything for one, two, and three. But above like three angles, he's just over with. He can't do it. So that's as far as he got. And thank you. And I hope that helped y'all on the Pythagorean theorem. And on who I wrote my paper about. So. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, my name is Erica, and this is Miss Sharon, and she is making a quilt. Quilt. So the math problem that I decided to give her, because this is what she do all the time, and she's gonna teach me how to do it soon, <laughs> is forty-eight plus x equal sixty. She has is six across. Nope, six this way. Oh, six down. And eight that way. And eight that way. That gets me to 48, and that's a yard. And that's a yard. That's a yard of material. But she needs 60 squares. Yes. So technically, I need 12 more. So that's 60 minus the 48 equals 12. So I'll need to make 12 more squares out of the additional material. <laughs> So how you gonna Which do this are, math problem? So to get the 12, since I can get six across, when I cut the yard, when I cut this yard, uh -huh. I'll take another piece of material and it takes about a fourth of a yard because you do two more, two more rows uh -huh. this way and that's six and six, which will give me the 12, which will give me 60. So on the second piece of material, I'll need about a Technically, it's about a fourth of a yard of material to get my other 12. So, the math problem she's supposed to do is get the X by itself. There's the X, which is 12. <laughs> You're supposed to put negative 48 yeah, to yeah, the okay. other side. <laughs> sure, sure. 48, negative 48, <laughs> and that's X equals. 12. And that is how she find how many squares she is going to be missing. So she had to get another yard to finish. Work on that. Yes. Just get my Thank squares. you guys and have a blessed day. This is Bob Dotson and this is the Ace Hardware in Hamlet where he works. As one might expect from a hardware, there are a lot of numbers involved. 
everything is kept track of with item numbers, and all items are priced manually, so putting out stock becomes a sea of numbers to sort through and calculate. Many items also rely on measurements from pipes to fencings to screws, and sometimes these measurements need to be converted to and from metric. Although there are a lot of numbers, the math is not too difficult, it just needs to be fast and accurate. A good example would be if somebody wanted to install screen in a 32 by 72 inch door window. The screen would have to be a little bit larger than the hole, so it would be rounded up to 36 by 80 inches. The price of the screen is in feet squared, so it would have to be converted into feet. 36 divided by 12 is 3 feet, and 80 divided by 12 is 6.67 feet. Multiply those together to get 20.01 feet squared. Multiplied by 99 cents, it would come out to be $19.81, plus a 6.75% tax, which is $1.34. The total of the purchase would be $21.15. Hey guys, my name is uh, Robert Hodges, and I'm in Math 171. And today I would like to present my Math and People project. Um, the title I chose for this project is Home Run, and as you can guess, it has to do with baseball. I was presented with the question, um, how much do the teams, the MLB teams, get, um, and what percent of their revenue is accounted for the entire amount of revenue? So, uh, I'm going to present that real quick. So, first, um, just a little rundown the MLB. Um, the actual association gets $10.37 million in revenue that was taken in 2019, and that is a uh, citation right there. Um, that's actually not what we're working with right now. We're actually going to be working with this number right here, um, and that is actually the total. So what I did is I actually took four of the um, biggest teams, the uh, biggest revenue teams, and I did some math. So what we did is we have the team, their revenue, the math behind it, the percentage of this number with that and just a little side note, their current worth um, and I'll explain why this is right there. So um, what I did uh, is I calculated their amount and I put it into scientific notation just to make it a little bit smaller so there's not so many zeros. I did the calculations and the New York Yankees out of um, their revenue is actually 32.07% of the entire number. For the Los Angeles Dodgers is 26.1%. For the Boston Red Sox is 2437. And for the Chicago Cubs is 22.11. Um, I put these numbers here because I thought that it would just show the impact of the amount of revenue that they actually make and um, just a little side note it's also great for the economy this association is great for the economy and I hope you guys enjoyed the data that has been provided and I hope it has sparked some interest and I uh, hope you all have a great day so today we have the math and people project mine is called Einstein and the brilliant mind we're going to use Einstein's most famous equation which is A equals MC squared. It means that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So first we have matter, which can be a solid, liquid, or gas. And we have mass equals resistance to acceleration. The amount of matter is the mass. Other units are sometimes used. Second, we have energy. There are two types, or two main types. Kinetic energy is when you have a mass that's moving. Potential energy is the mass that's, that's stored. The S1 unit of energy is the joules which is J. Matter and energy are different forms of the same thing. Matter is energy contracted into a small, small space and it can be converted to energy or vice versa. So now we have E equals MC squared. E is the energy contained in an object and is measured in joules. M is the mass of the object and is measured in kilograms. C is the speed of light, which is about three times 10 to the eighth power milliseconds. So we have a question here. Suppose two grams of water could be completely converted to energy. How much energy will be produced with a C equals three times 10 to the eighth milliseconds? So we have two grams, so we convert that to kilograms, so it would be 0 0.002 kilograms. As you can see, we divided two by a thousand. 
with two grams divided by a thousand. So we used a formula A equals C MC squared. And we filled in the kilograms and multiplied it by three times 10 to the A squared, which gave us 1.8 times 10 to the 14th joules. I hope what I've done here today will help you understand about A equals MC squared. After talking to my girlfriend's mom, Karen, she explained that she comes in contact with many different people throughout her day and even more over the week. This past week, she said that on Monday, she met with 19 teachers, and on Wednesday, she met with nine more teachers. And on Thursday, she met with 18 teachers, and on Friday, she met with five teachers. After those meetings, she had 11 teachers reach out to her and discuss some things. Then she told me that she had about 56 emails a week. She has 22 emails filed on a folder, and she responded to 12 of them. So if I added up all the teachers she had meetings with this week, they would equal up to 51 teachers. After that, you would add up all the emails she received. She got 11 me emails after the meetings. Then add the additional 56 she received, also 22 emails she has in folders. And, and she said that she responded to 12 of them, so how many emails does she have left to respond to? You would add up the 56 to 11 plus 22 in the folders, then subtract 12 in which she already responded to. So after discussing the amount of people Karen comes into contact with, we see that mathematics can be considered. Thank you for watching with us today, and maybe you can help Tom find out an answer to his problem in the comments below.